Good morning, colleagues. I would like to thank the organizing committee of this second international conference on crisis communication and conflict resolution for inviting me as one of your keynote speakers. In looking at the program for this year's conference, it is inspiring to see colleagues representing universities and organizations from 14 countries and four continents talking about some of the most challenging risks, crises, conflicts, and wicked problems that the world is facing. I see presentations scheduled for this conference addressing, of course, the invasion of Ukraine and COVID-19, but also more broadly examining contexts related to health, politics, entertainment, journalism, business, fake news, resilience, and social media in different countries and areas of practice and research. I know right now it can feel difficult to celebrate anything. And for those of us who regularly research crisis and conflict, we talk about the dark, the wicked, the sad, the macabre, all as part of our regular everyday experience. But let us celebrate this moment. In this moment, we have the opportunity to be together, even in a mediated platform, to share the work that we are doing in a global forum and be a part of the remarkable developments in the field of crisis communication. Crisis communication is still a very young subfield of communication, with our real origins dating from 1995 to 1997 as a recognized field of study. For about the first decade, crisis communication was largely American-centric, with most of the research published and presentations in the United States. Then, as the field expanded into Western Europe, I believe that Europe emerged as a critical center for the next stage of the field's innovation and development. We saw then that the field took hold in Asia, with a significant amount of development coming from, in particular, China and South Korea. And in recent years, we see the field developing in Eastern Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, along with Southeast Asia, and the next frontier really is Central and South America, as we have colleagues there beginning to join our international networks and share their research with us. I also have no doubt that we have been very busy in the last couple of years, not just because of the pandemic and now the Ukrainian invasion with the damage and the displacement that it's causing, but also because more organizations are recognizing the importance of critically reflecting on how we can engage with people about risk, crisis, and conflict more effectively. One of the critical lessons that we've learned, I think, as academics from the pandemic is that we can and should be engaging with one another more broadly. I know that we're beginning to return to face-to-face -face conferences, but one of the opportunities that we should not abandon are those opportunities to share and to discuss our work virtually as well. Last year, it became increasingly clear that we weren't going to be able to get together again for face-to-face -face conferences, I think we began to be very creative. For example, the leadership team for the crisis communication section for Korea, myself, Florian Meissner, and Sylvia Ravazzani, decided to host a monthly seminar series with participants and observers from around the world, even people joining us at the very, very late or early hours of the day. And in some meaningful ways, we felt like we were able to broaden the discussion about risk and crisis because of these opportunities. And of course, we were not alone. Conferences like this one, other seminars, workshops, webinars, and general discussion about the crises we're facing have emerged around the world. The outcomes of this sharing, to me, have also been evident in the excellence and the diversity of scholarship that we're now seeing being submitted to journals, including the one that I edit, the International Journal of Crisis and Risk Communication Research. But aside from the academic pursuits, I'm also seeing evidence of increasing engagement with practitioners, partnerships with organizations, and generally a purse to translate research into action like we've never seen before. For example, the World Health Organization is continuing to develop its network of scholars and health practitioners to explore risk and community engagement opportunities. International practitioner associations, like the International Association for Risk and Crisis Communication Research, have partnered with the ACREA Crisis Communication Section to bring together research and practice more effectively. 
And we're also seeing increasing opportunities for big project funding that is able to bring together international collaborations of academics and practitioners to evaluate risk and crisis communication to learn how to do it better in the future. These are all reasons to celebrate the development of our field and the opportunities within it. It's probably also a call to action for everyone to be willing just to drop someone an email or a DM to see if they'd be interested in working together, presenting, guest speaking, or engaging in some way, and then follow up on it. I know we're all busy and we probably forget about half the good ideas that we talk about with folks, but keep coming back to these conversations because they create interesting opportunities to contribute to our field. And this is what I really want to talk about today. When we talk about risk, crisis, and conflict communication, what are we talking about? The big idea that I want to talk about is that we should be thinking about crisis communication beyond crisis response and generally broadening the scope of how we think about crisis communication. This is something that I've been thinking about for a while, but began to come together in 2019 when I was sitting with a friend of mine in New Zealand drinking some very good wine and talking about the relative states of our field, me crisis and him in intercultural communication. And he said something along the lines of, well, crisis is really just focused on the corporate context, isn't it? Now, he was partly making fun of me because he knows that I'm not a particularly corporate person but partly not because as a field, we have focused so much on the corporate or business context for crises that when we read a lot of the public relations journals and see crisis mentioned, it's often in the corporate context. Of course, with so many colleagues here coming from political, media, risk and conflict traditions, it would seem strange to talk about crisis communication as something that is predominantly a field connected to business or the corporate context. And personally, I've always thought of crisis communication as a multidisciplinary field of study, bringing together a variety of interests and solving challenging problems. But I think that it is a conception we need to think about, that crisis communication is more than just reputation, more than improving an organization's survivability or profitability. Crisis communication is about people. And that, to me, is how we should be thinking about crisis communication as a context for engagement between organizations and stakeholders that endeavors to prevent, mitigate, manage, and recover from crises, conflicts, and disasters. If we think about the life cycle of a crisis, then we have to think about all of this as inherently connected. That is my proposition. And in the next 20 to 25 minutes, I'm going to share a little bit about my academic journey and some of the lessons I've learned along the way about asking the right questions and being cautious about the assumptions that I make and arguing that the organization shouldn't matter, especially to the organization. I was recently asked how I found my way to crisis communication. This isn't a new question and it's probably one we've all answered before. So normally my answer to that question is a bit more glib, that I'm interested in what happens when things go wrong just to other people. But to be fair, that's not entirely accurate. I think a better way of characterizing how I've gotten here today is to describe my career as a series of coincidences of interest, timing, and opportunity. I come from a very rural and very western part of the US. I'm originally from Colorado. When I was a kid, my parents were ranchers, and that, by coincidence, timing, and opportunity, led them to developing one of the top horse photography companies in the US. So from the age of about 12, I was working for them for selling pictures and then taking them. And all of that developed into a multimedia, multi-platform horse marketing company. So while I started my time at university as a political science major, with an emphasis on political philosophy and also an intercollegiate debater, it's not hard to figure out how I found the field of communication. It fit with how I had experienced the world to that point. When I moved to my postgraduate work, as a Coloradan, I didn't think that going to the University of Wyoming for my master's would be a cultural experience. 
but within a week of being on campus i was told the story of why the statue of the mascot was facing north and that was so it could aim its butt to colorado at that point it was pretty clear i wasn't from around those parts and that got me to thinking i'm a liberal rural white kid from colorado and i felt different what would it mean to actually be different and living in wyoming well, in 1998, in the rural U.S., being LGBTQ plus was still challenging. So I knew that I wanted to do an organizational ethnography, and I got permission to do that with the LGBTA, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Association on campus. I was barely two weeks into my study and just getting to know the group when I got a call from my supervisor at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and he asked if I'd heard. I had no idea what he was talking about. It was 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and I was in my early 20s. Then he said, Matthew Shepard was found tied to a fence post and badly beaten. It's not clear whether he's going to live or die. Your thesis is going to take a new direction. Matthew was a young gay man in Laramie and a member of the LGBTA. He did die from his injuries, and the young men who beat him to death were tried and convicted. Matthew and a young black man named James Bird Jr., who was murdered in Texas around the same time were the catalyst for the passage of the Matthew Shepard and James Bird Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, which was put into law a decade after the young men were murdered. And my supervisor was right. My thesis changed. It evolved into an ethnography of an organization in crisis and watching how the members used the LGBTA for social support, sense-making, and also to share the story about social and political issues that they chose to share. The development of sophisticated and a strategic approach to engaging with the media, the university, police, opponents, friends, and family. And of course, that began my interest in crisis communication. But there are lessons about what it means to be a goodwill actor, about developing a communication strategy, and about learning from mistakes that I learned from watching them, and I carry that still with me some 20 plus years later. It also shaped how I think about the role of organizations in crisis as well. For me, the role of the organization is to safeguard the interests of their stakeholders, inside and out, in what is most often a very messy, contentious, and risky environment. Untangling the messiness is, I think, what fascinates me the most. And over the years, I've had the opportunity to work with organizations like the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault to not only support the survivors of sexual assault more effectively, but also to successfully lobby the Texas State Legislature to change the laws and allow female sexual assault survivors to have access to emergency com contraception. To accomplish this, we had to identify the communication and engagement strategies to change a largely conservative state legislature's perspective on emergency contraception so that the survivors of sexual assault could have the opportunity to prevent an unwanted pregnancy. And we did so effectively in 2003. This wasn't about responding to crises, though each assault is a personal crisis. This was about risk reduction and mitigation. I've also had the opportunity to work with organizations like Applied Materials to launch major organizational change initiatives in the shared services part of their global business as a response to changes in legislation brought about by major accounting scandals in the US in the early 2000s, as well as the company's own embezzlement crisis. More recently, I've had the opportunity to explore the intersection of the legacy of colonialism, discrimination, conflict and political movements, as well as crisis in the context of the exploring the Scottish independence movement. So very much by coincidence of interest, opportunity and timing, I've worked with organizations and on research before, during and after crises and believe strongly in the interconnectedness of risk, crisis response and organizational learning in local, state, national and international contexts for interaction. This has led me to the conclusion that the organization shouldn't matter, especially to the organization. Now, I can promise you this isn't a naive view of a glossy world of social responsibility. It's quite pragmatic. 
So, so stay with me for this. If we think about two competing and diametrically opposed views of the world, shareholder value versus citizenship. In shareholder value, we see a perspective that embraces a very American business view of the world, which the only stakeholder that matters is the shareholder because profitability or cost saving in a non-business context is the most important value. The argument from this perspective is that achieving sustainable value is balancing the economic and ethical choices and its strengths focusing on enriching stakeholders and improving the economic performance of a system. However, it assumes that self-interest maximizes long-term thinking. The reality is, of course, relatively different, with the perspective resulting in short-term profits, forgetting that long-term profits require trust and goodwill with different stakeholders than just shareholders, and an alienation of manager and shareholder interests from the question of the public good. On the other side of the spectrum is citizenship, which makes the argument that organizations are socially responsible for not only meeting legal, ethical, and economic responsibilities placed on them by shareholders, but that organizations should aim to create higher standards of living and quality of life in their communities. This notion that organizations are members of the community means that there is a direct link placed between the fiduciary responsibility and the social welfare. But two of the critical challenges is that there's an inconclusive level of empirical support for the outcomes of this, and the notion that organizational citizenship also happens to be dependent on managerial discretion and values. In my mind, this continuum makes the wrong assumption. Both of these perspectives make the organization the center of attention when it shouldn't be. It's the organization's stakeholders that matter the most. Stakeholder-based theory makes a very different assumption about the world. It assumes that the organization exists to serve the interests of their stakeholders. It integrates resource-based interests, market-based interests, and adds socio and political interests. Therefore, the central question for organizations adopting a stakeholder view is how the organization can serve and achieve sustainable value which not only offers an ethically superior view to the shareholder value approach, but also provides better guidance for decision-making than a citizenship-based view. The biggest challenge with the stakeholder view is the problem of balancing stakeholder interests. Not all stakeholders are going to be viewed as equal, and so how an organization manages those relationships is a key problem to solve. I like to think of this problem as a love triangle when organizations and stakeholders are negotiating their relationships with each other and issues of mutual interest. It is in that negotiation of interests that organizations begin to make strategic decisions, but never in a vacuum, always in the context of the issues and the stakeholders they're trying to engage with. And herein lies my basis for arguments that one, the organization shouldn't be the primary focus, and two, that crisis communication is much, much more than just crisis response. Let's take each of these points in order. One of the core problems of the citizenship perspective is that it's difficult to measure, and we see this borne out in mixed findings about social responsibility all the time. In a lot of cases, social responsibility programs for companies, governments, and charitable organizations means that the initiatives end up looking a bit like putting lipstick on a pig. We can dress an organization up, make it look nice, make it smell nice, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will lead people to believe that the organization is trustworthy or reputable. Some scholars even argue that social responsibility can create additional pressure and risk. So the notion of social responsibility is clearly a, so a challenged concept. Yet if we tackle this from a stakeholder perspective and stop making it about the organization and then make it about the stakeholders, we can begin to better understand that judgments about an organization's social responsibility are about the motivation or hygiene perceptions. I like to think about this dichotomy by asking a simple question. By showering regularly and using deodorant, does it make us good people? Of course not. It simply makes us more tolerable to be around, especially when it's hot out. This is a core judgment that stakeholders make
about organizations. Do stakeholders believe the organization is motivated to be good, or are they just doing it for their own purposes and their own gains? We know from years of crisis research that organizations with good reputations are more crisis proof than those with poor reputations, but what does this really mean? In a broader view, I've found that what stakeholders seem to want today are organizations that act authentically. But authenticity judgments are made up of not just the organization's reputation, but also whether people feel like they can influence the organization and whether they see the organization as having a positive and localized impact on their own communities. It's not about an organization doing great work far and wide, but how they treat their own employees, do they seem like they care about their communities? All of this in realms of normal operation, not just special programs. So when that is the case, it changes the relationship between the organization and the stakeholders. And this is what enables organizations to better engage with their stakeholders. On the opposite side, if organizations make their stakeholders feel powerless, if the organization seems only interested in global contexts, if it has a bad reputation and it uses any of its good works as shameless self-promotion, then the organization probably isn't going to be able to effectively engage with their stakeholders and it will be less credible. In short, being a good organization drives authenticity judgments and so crisis communication is much, much more than just crisis response. It is simply being better at serving stakeholder interests. In doing so, organizations become more crisis resilient, are better able to respond to crises, and better able to activate different publics for their help, support, compliance, and feedback, all of which are necessary during a crisis. Now, my view on this has changed over the years. I began my research in earnest on crisis communication, assuming that matching the crisis response message to the situation was the ticket to good crisis communication. This was informed by my background in advertising, persuasion, and in the early crisis communication research that focused very much on image repair and aligning communication strategy with situation. I just thought we hadn't uncovered all of the factors or possible messages. So my PhD work began in earnest, trying to collect all the research on crisis response and identify all the potential tactics that could be found. And I did. There were roughly about 50 to 60 individual tactics that were identified in the research over the years, and they fall into about eight response categories. To date, this is the broadest and most inclusive view of the tactics and response categories that I've seen. The problem comes in how we put these together and the factors influencing them. My PhD sampled about 300 crises with messages gathered as the crisis broke, at a midpoint in the crisis, and as, the, in, as part of the post-crisis recovery stage, ensuring a cross-industry and cross-crisis type of representation. And of course, there were findings that give us a glimpse into how different key factors begin to influence crisis response. That organization type and crisis type certainly influence how organizations can and probably should respond to crises. However, my goal of finding the golden ticket of matching the best crisis responses to different situations was painfully unrealistic. And the more than more that I've researched over the years, I've found significantly greater predictive value in the existing relationships between organizations, stakeholders, and issues than the crisis response itself. In many cases, the crisis response just doesn't explain post-crisis attitudes nor behavioral intention towards organizations, but trust, reputation, perceived competence to handle the issues, and personal engagement and uncertainty about the issues, those have real predictive power. So at the risk of being controversial, crisis response itself matters significantly less than being judged as a good organization that authentically serves its stakeholders' interests. Now, let me caveat that. Crisis response matters to the extent that organizations can really hurt themselves by badly responding or not responding at all. So there is significant risk in responding poorly to a crisis. Also, the evidence is showing that in prolonged crises like COVID or in conflict situations 
Organizations that respond well will improve their outcomes, especially those connected to stakeholders taking self-protective behaviors and maintaining or improving in some cases, the relationships between the organizations and their stakeholders in the long term. But in the main, what drives people's attitudes and intention about organizations during and after crises are their attitudes about the organization and issues affecting both of them before the crisis. So when I argue that the organization shouldn't matter, especially to the organization, what I mean is that when organizations focus on objectives that are self-focused, and not on stakeholder is or the issues that they are likely to be judged as inauthentic. When crises emerge, this means that stakeholders will move to distance themselves from the organization instead of bolstering the organization. And, and let me give you probably my favorite example of this. In 2016 for Valentine's Day, Adidas posted on Instagram a picture of two women's legs in an embrace and the simple caption, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Though the post was generally received all kinds of positive feedback, not surprisingly, there are a minority of responses that were negative and focused on criticisms of homosexuality and objection to the portrayal of homosexual relationships by the brand. Generally, Adidas didn't offer much of a response to the reputational crisis, but the stakeholders identifying with their community certainly did. Of course, the company would have expected some negative feedback, but for the most part, it allowed its brand community to activate and those aligned with the values communicated in the post defended both the company and the post. This is a very concrete demonstration, not only of the power of brand communities or political and social communities, but also how creating a brand community that is built on something shared attitudes and shared values provides even the most global of corporations critical value. It also demonstrates how extended stakeholder networks can be activated in the co-creation of shared values, issue mitigation, and even crisis response. Building these kinds of communities don't happen over the night. This was the result of a corporate strategy emphasizing a co-creation of value with their consumers. We've also seen this with companies like Nike and Ben and & Jerry's, where even global brands focus on issues and focus on stakeholder interests and are simply better able to weather criticisms, investigation, and crises. What my research has consistently found is that organizations that are trusted and generally have a good reputation can weather even transgressions where the organization's actually done something wrong at least once. Where organizations get into trouble is when they fail to learn from the mistakes of the past or fail to demonstrate improvement. This is why when we think of the crisis life cycle, we should be thinking of crisis communication as inclusive of risk management, crisis response, and post-crisis learning, and doing so from a stakeholder perspective. Now, this isn't about altruism in a very stereotypically Gen X cynical view. I don't actually think that altruism exists, but it's about constructing crisis resilient organizations that serve stakeholder interests. By making decisions with the confluence of stakeholder and organizational interests together, organizations are more likely to do the right thing more often. It's also not about fuzzy mission statements. Frankly, research suggests that most people aren't interested in an organization's mission statement, but in the relationship to issues that they care about. For example, asking the question of how the fashion or energy industry are becoming more sustainable is much more important for stakeholders than a company like BP rebranding itself as a green energy company, which just comes out sounding a bit like CSR promotionalism or that lipstick on the pig. Globally, right now, we are seeing the consequences of an era of putting lipstick on pigs, and the consequences are and should be worrying. In most countries, we see a crisis of confidence in institutions and actors, ranging from corporations to governments to non-governmental actors, and for good reasons. These institutions have failed to manage the relationships between themselves, their stakeholders, and the issues affecting both of them. Why, for example, are disinformation campaigns about vaccination creating global problems with vaccination, and not just for COVID, but also for routine vaccinations? 
because media, governments, and health authorities are not only losing the trust of many people, but they have also often failed to effectively translate the science to stakeholders. This creates an information vacuum, and that information vacuum will be filled. We have to stop thinking about people, for example, who are vaccine hesitant as nutty American wackadoos who believe in QAnon, that lizard people control us all, and that Bill Gates is trying to implant us all with microchips. Of course the nutters exist. My hundred-year-old great-uncle recently died of COVID because his son has drunk the Kool-Aid of disinformation campaigns and not only doesn't believe in the vaccination, but doesn't really even think that COVID is that big of a deal. But that's not the majority of the vaccine hesitant. We need to think about people who are vaccine hesitant as parents who are trying to make the best decisions for their kids, or people in countries like Croatia who were forced to get vaccines whether they wanted them or not during older regimes, or in high trust societies like Sweden or Norway, where people readily took vaccines for swine flu because their countries were worried about the epidemic, but those vaccines had negative health effects. And we also need to think about them as ethnic minorities in countries like the US and UK, who have profound and well-grounded distrust in institutions because of historic experience with these institutions. When I talk about the big idea of thinking about crisis communication as the total package of risk, crisis response, and organizational learning to create better and more responsive organizations that are connected with their stakeholders and perceived as trying to act in their stakeholders' best interests, then that means a lot about the mass media models of public relations, journalism, and governments also need to be reconsidered.